Okay, let's uh, start. So, uh, <coughs> so last time I had started looking at uh, Bluetooth LE, and uh, if you recall, kind of the basic concept was that um, we have sort of the sensors or kind of the tinier devices are like servers, and they advertise themselves that they have some information, and uh, the uh, bigger devices like your phones and all they kind of scan and the one of the things was that basically just that process itself is able to convey some information so uh, that was a broadcast component and then uh, the additional notion was that if the device uh, if, if the central device the client needs more information then it would send a connection request packet and the peripheral device will respond with it, and they'll agree upon some period in which they will uh, communicate, and, but the idea is that that way some additional information can be sent by the peripheral device to uh, uh, back to the main guy. But all of this is still information from servers to, uh, from the sensors or servers to the clients, um, but then additionally, if you want to have information in a bi-directional manner, that's done through connections. So today, what I'm going to do is start with what happens in uh, the subsequent process where uh, not the initial advertisement, but the subsequent information exchange, how is that structured? So uh, the information, ex the initial information exchange, the advertisement part, it's basically kind of defined by the standard as a payload, but in that there are some fields that can be defined by the manufacturer, and um, that's what, for example, iBeacons and all use by kind of redefining them for their own purpose. But the subsequent mes message exchange uh, is defined by the Bluetooth standard uh, in a particular manner, in particular what is called as generic attribute profile. So the concept being that information is presented as a set of attributes, um, think of them like key value pairs or, okay, and uh, they can be read or written to. So that's kind of the basic uh, idea, but they're organized in uh, something called services and characteristics. And this is how they create uh, st uh, structured information for different types of devices, let's say uh, heart rate sensors or thermostats or things like that. So there are a whole bunch of these uh, uh, things that have been created as part of the standard so that if you buy a certain class of device uh, from different vendors, they will all kind of work with your app, for example. Okay, so uh, so this is, uh, the important thing is that this is really after uh, that initial advertisement. The initial advertisement is, like I said, defined sort of separately. So what this makes use of is this generic way of structuring information, which is called the attribute protocol. And uh, uh, important point again uh, also is that this information is sent, uh, is no longer broadcast. So it is uh, in response to a particular client's request, so it is really exclusive, uh, exclusive to that. Uh, and in particular, um, uh, Sort of other devices, like for example, if you have multiple phones and one phone is engaged in this kind of dialogue now with the sensor, then that's the information being sent by the sensor is no longer visible to uh, other phones nearby. So, and this connection is also the only way uh, two way information is possible. So, reading and writing of, 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 of the things. So, what's happening now is in this case now, uh, uh, in this phase, Peripheral devices, the servers, mind you, are creating exclusive connections with the central devices like your phones. And in this case, now phone is uh, sort of playing the role of the hub, right? I mean, it can have such one is to one connection with a variety of uh, devices. And um, uh, what, what uh, needs to be done if you want to have like sensor to sensor communication is that it has to be done through the central device. So there is no way like the, let's say, hexavares and kind of these tinier sensors that you buy, they cannot talk to each other. They have to kind of exchange information through uh, through the central device somehow. Okay, so let's uh, uh, look at how uh, 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 this thing works now. So 
for purposes of this protocol, the server, the holder of information uh, is the peripheral and uh, the client is your uh, a client is your peripherals and uh, things like that. And uh, when that initial negotiation takes place for establishing a connection, this is happening, uh, mind you, right after the broadcast period uh, where um, uh, the central asks for additional information. As part of it, there is also some negotiation about how often this would be done, so some sort of a period which is negotiated. And the idea is then uh, at with that period, the central device will try to reconnect and uh, but it's not guaranteed and the and you will arrange for the peripheral to wake up at that period so this is where kind of duty cycling comes in so essentially the sensor uh, and the um, uh, phone negotiate some interval at which uh, the phone will contact and uh, get the information out so this this is what ends up happening which is at that negotiated period the master will send a request make it the response and this is happening not on those broadcast channels but on a separate data channel so how is this information organized so uh, there are three concepts profile service and characteristics uh, so uh, 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 let's look at kind of what these mean just by way of uh, example so profile is just uh, that there's no object called profile, it is just a bundling of uh, uh, in information of a certain type and uh, these are defined as part of industry-wide negotiations and also for example, uh, there's a heart rate profile, okay, and that profile is then a collection of services. So any device which complies with a profile will offer the services to fall under that. So in this case, the heart rate profile has two services, a heart rate service and a device information service. Then the service is what describes what kind of things are as part of the service. So in particular, and you can think of the service as a sort of a structure or a class, okay? So it's describing uh, different things. So each um, uh, sort of field within the service, if you may, is called a characteristic. So a service can have multiple characteristics. Uh, a service has a unique um, UUID. So it's this uh, uh, yeah, so a set of bits which basically uh, are identification. And so heart rate service, for example, has a 16-bit UID of 0x, 1a, 0b. So uh, you can, uh, the fact that a device offers a certain uh, service is part of that advertisement. So by examining those ads, you can see what kind of device it is. So you can easily know what is around you uh, and perhaps other information as part of it. Um, yeah. And then uh, what are the characteristics available? So uh, heart rate service contains up to three characteristics. Um, yeah. So remember, heart rate profile has a heart rate service and a device information service. The heart rate service has three fields. Uh, there's a heart rate measurement, which is mandatory. And then there are two other ones, body sensor location, so where is it, like on the left wrist, right wrist, those kind of things. And then the heart rate control point, which I don't know what it is, but uh, sort of uh, something again uh, related with it. So essentially, the <coughs> dumbest possible heart rate sensor would basically just provide the heart rate measurement, and there is some industrial, uh, whatever, um, uh, standard-based agreement on what that Kind of means. Do you have a question? No. Yeah. So is the heart rate service the only service on the heart rate profile? Or is there no, so there was a second service too, right? Uh, the device information service. Oh, so there are two services. Uh, and the heart rate service in turn has three characteristics, two of which are optional. Okay. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of such profiles and all for different industry segments and all which have been defined. And if you are designing a product, it would behoove the vendor to kind of comply with these things so that uh, it can work with variety of software apps and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, characteristic is basically uh, what encapsulates a single data point. So data point is a term which in the sensing industry is used, but you can basically think of it as um, 
the uh, kind of the final nameable thing basically okay a measurement okay or a control so uh, but in turn it can have multiple channels so for example it may consist of three channels of an accelerometer okay so it doesn't have to be a scalar uh, it too has uh, predefined uh, ways of identifying it uh, and uh, and what you can also do is there are uh, kind of standard characteristics that again the Bluetooth uh, consortium or SIG special interest group has defined so that would mean that uh, basically says that this particular uh, thing means the same way like its acceleration in meter per second square or uh, whatever heart rate and beats per minute things like that so you do need to have some agreement so that you can make sense out of these so typically units are going to be one thing that we would agree upon but you can also define custom characteristics which only your software understands now again for specialized peripherals <coughs> and all uh, that you're creating that that would be up to you and then you will give it uh, give that characteristics a different UI, UUID uh, than kind of one of the standard ones so for example heart rate measurement characteristic has a UUID of this defined by the standard uh, and it's an 8-bit uh, data value um, uh, it, it, has, it, has, it has a bunch of things so there's an 8-bit value which says what is the format of the rest of the data so the rest of the data could be either u8 or u8 or u8 16 and then the actual heart rate measurement data so that's that constitutes the heart rate characteristic and that heart rate characteristic is a mandatory part of the heart rate service and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to add here, uh, when I was working on the DOE project, uh, one thing, one problem we ran into is certain characteristics are basically meant for sort of like a low rate Data? Yes. Okay. At, at the maximum so uh, it's sort of not, not great. Okay. So, so, so I guess, yes, I'm not familiar with it. Presumably, there's a profile meant for that, basically. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah. Apple's AirPods use DOE or DOE Plus? Apple's what? AirPods. AirPods are uh, using uh, standard Bluetooth, not DLE. The data rate and all are too high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, your um, yeah, whatever, headphones, microphones, and all are classic Bluetooth, Apple has additional stuff around it to make the pairing and all kind of easier. Uh, so that's their more customized part, but it's the standard Bluetooth. On the other, so for example, I mean. Uh, I, I was just reading and uh, some, uh, some situations that are trying to uh, interface like earphones with DOE, is it like theoretically it can support? Yeah, theoretically it can, but just remember, I mean, high quality audio is way too high rate for what DLE is meant for. So people try to do all sort of stuff, uh, okay? Uh, but, um, uh, and, and it's good as a hobby hobby kind of stuff, but BLE is just not meant for uh, that. I mean, to begin with, it's duty cycled, okay? So you're, the thing is, yeah, sure, you can operate it with very high duty cycle, very low interval, but kind of then defeats the point. Might as well just use a different. Okay, so I sincerely doubt that Apple is using DLE to transfer audio data. It's much too high quality for that. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, yeah, uh, so I guess uh, this is your reward service, okay? Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, you have both read and write uh, going on, uh, so that's the abstraction. Now within the, usually these Bluetooth modules that you buy, it's not just the radio, they have a processor in there. And uh, in Hexaware, I mentioned in one of the early slides that there is a separate sort of processor to which the radio is attached. And that processor uh, takes care of all of this because as you can imagine, this is sort of fairly complicated protocol. If you had to implement all this service and stuff like that, then uh, you need some support. So one way you can do it is that you would have, uh, it would be done by some sort of a lower level device driver stack or some library 
So if you are working with Python, for example, there is indeed such a library for you to work with, uh, to deal with. But even then, things would be pretty complicated. So usually these modules come with a built-in processor, um, again, kind of typically an ARM, low-end ARM processor, and it takes care of all of this for you. And then it would provide some custom proprietary interface for you to work with this thing. So in case of Hexaware, those of you are programming Hexaware, so uh, the Bluetooth processor talks to the main processor over either an I2C link or a, um, I think it's I2C and SPI, I think it support, supports two modes, and it basically has defined its own private protocol so that your software on the embed side can now exchange information with this other processor, and all these details are taken care of by it, so that other processor maintains the characteristics and things like that and responds to those. So even if your main processor is asleep, the <coughs> other party can send a Bluetooth message and the Bluetooth processor is going to respond with the right value. And what uh, proprietary protocol lets you do is to read and write uh, to the data structures inside that second processor. So if you look at the code and all, they kind of show examples of how to sort of go around around doing it, but these details are typically just handled for you by uh, low, something lower down, either a device driver or uh, uh, in many of these devices, just the second processor is doing it. So this is an example, uh, peripheral device organized as having a bunch of service and then inside the service, bunch of characteristics. And some of these characteristics are read only, uh, in which case, your phone can read these. So these would be typically things like temperature and all, or you could uh, write to it as well, and those would be things like, I don't know, turn on the light switch or stuff like that. So any actuation can matter. So, um, yeah, I've already shown this. So, uh, but keep in mind the characteristic itself is a complicated data structure, so it can have a whole bunch of additional information in it. Okay, so it's really, complete data structure. Now, what goes over the air? So what goes over the air is uh, kind of the so-called DLE frame, and um, what it has is, it has, a, it has a one by preamble, so that's the first uh, sort of lightish yellow color thing. Then it has uh, four bytes syscode, which basically says something about the RF channel being used, so that's the second field out there. Uh, then it has a protocol data unit or PDU, and that can have anywhere from 2 to 39 bytes. So that's the purple color thing. And then finally, three bytes of cyclic redundancy code for um, acting as a error detector. Okay. Then in the payload, in the PDU, uh, you, can, uh, in, 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 uh, you can have a variety of uh, uh, sort of ways of organizing this thing. So uh, there is a advertisement channel PDU, data channel PDU. So there these PDUs can come in variety of structures. Each one of them is separately defined. So like for example, the advertising channel PDU has a header and a payload. The header is two bytes and the payload is anywhere from zero to 37 bytes. Uh, and uh, this uh, payload um, uh, itself, uh, I guess the shortest packet, kind of we work it out, is 80 bits, and that takes 80 microseconds. The longest packet is 276 bits, around 0 0.3 milliseconds. And uh, uh, when we talked about I beacons and stuff like that, that is really dealing with this particular PDU, okay? And uh, there are additional sort of structures defined within it, and if you recall in one of the slides I had said that there is up to 31 bytes which are end up being actually available for you to use out here. So advertising, ad, advertisement uh, channel, the advertising PDU, 16-bit PDU header, and depending upon, uh, I think up to 31 bytes of information, okay? Um, uh, and then in response to this advertisement, the central scanner can request an additional 31 bytes of information, so that's a follow-on packet. So essentially, kind of the notion out here is that without any prior pairing, you can, uh, with a device, you can, you can exchange, uh, you can receive up to 62 bytes of information. 
and you can do a lot with it okay i mean yeah and that's that's what these beacons do you can put some sensory data in it stuff like that of course what you're not going to put there are private things which you don't want to be broadcast so you, you will limit it to things which are comfortable with the world knowing um, the data channel serves a separate purpose so data channel is when you have negotiated you have paired and now you are kind of doing that periodic transmission again 37 bytes of payload um, and uh, can have sort of a whole bunch of things and here uh, it is here where the whole um, uh, attributes, uh, reading the characteristics, reading and writing them, and all come into play. So this is this is what happens once you have paired up. Okay, so how does this kind of fit into the overall Bluetooth ecosystem? Uh, essentially, uh, it came as a extension. So so Bluetooth had gone through several generations, and at some point they kind of added this thing as an extension, um, and in essence. Um, what you have in Bluetooth 4 and like, fall on now Bluetooth 5 that there are two types of devices. There are dual mode devices which have the regular Bluetooth, uh, which is uh, BR slash ADR, and then they may also have Bluetooth LE, and a single mode device which may only have Bluetooth LE, and then you can have legacy Bluetooth which only have the sort of the regular Bluetooth. So. Uh, variety of these devices, but in a sense, the idea is your phones and Raspberry Pis and all are nowadays the Bluetooth dual mode devices, whereas the beacons and all tend to be the leftmost device, and older devices are the, the regular Bluetooth device. So, and the uh, I think I think there was also some uh, copyright type issues and all. So they had I think there was a Bluetooth Smart names were there was some change in name along the way also in this process. Okay, what happened since uh, uh, last I taught the course? So, uh, is Bluetooth five emerged, and uh, last year's phones have Bluetooth five built in built into them. So now you have, uh, uh, I guess, Samsung came out, uh, so iPhone eight, and so year two thousand seventeen phones, um, and. Uh, at this stage, there are some additional enhancements which have come out, but only lately have, like only in 2018, that we begin to see peripherals emerge to kind of begin to make use of these things. So, uh, some, there's some sort of things that Bluetooth 5 introduced is that it introduced additional uh, physical layer uh, things, additional waveforms, if you will. So, uh, there is the baseline thing, which is the same as kind of the older. Bluetooth 4, but then they also introduced uh, something called uh, LE2M and LE coded. And the idea is they are making kind of different trade offs in terms of speed and range and all. So essentially, you have data rate of a megabit, which was the original one, there is a higher rate version, 2 megabit one, and then there are two coded versions, which are uh, 500 kilobit and 125 kilobit. And the key thing is that these things have error correction in it. So remember, CRC is just error detection. It doesn't really help to make, make the channel more robust. Whereas FEC, they use some particular forward error correction scheme. Um, and then associated with also is the range version. So if you make the channel more robust, you can send the data longer. On the other hand, if you make the channel higher simple rate, then the range goes down. So you see that, that relative to the baseline Bluetooth, the two megabit channel notionally is loses some 20% of the range. On the other hand, if you heavily code, your rate goes down to 125 kilobits per second, but your range goes up after four. These are under some idealized line of sight kind of conditions and all your real life mileage may vary considerably. Um, all Bluetooth 5 requires is the same thing as Bluetooth 4, but it supports these optional modes as well. So now with, um, two megabit per second, you could imagine doing audio and all kind of stuff. So certainly some, some things begin, are, are in the realm of possibility. But again, remember this two megabit is really the symbol rate, okay? By the time you have taken care of all that overhead and all, you're probably going to get 30, 40% of that, okay? And that too in a shared channel, so, uh, so. Uh, I, I think I would need to say that uh, with, after having 
No, so I think it has BLE on it because Apple has created a whole bunch of pairing and smart smartness into that. Okay, so uh, these air th th these airports are pretty cool. I don't know if any of you have them, but um, it's yeah, and you can kind of move it from device to device and all. None of uh, I mean, you basically it detects by proximity and pair set. It's it's pretty cool. Uh, and a lot of Apple devices kind of have begun to, like their pencil for the iPad, they all have that, okay? So what Apple has done is created this additional layer of whatever, comfort features uh, using their chip around that, yeah. Is there any processing in the pods themselves, or is there a... In the? Like, is there any memory in the processing in the... I don't, I think other than probably some buffering or something, I don't think so, no. Uh, but I do have another, there is another company called Braggy Dash, it's a German company, uh, which has, which had come out with something like Apple's a while back, and their uh, version, it's kind of somewhat bigger, uh, but they have a processor in there, they have some uh, memory in which songs and all can be stored, a couple of gig kind of thing, and it has nine or 10 different sensors like IMU and all, okay? So you could just wear it and exercise, and uh, the only thing is that the battery life was like, not even lasted my one treadmill run, so pretty, pretty bad, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Nokia has been showing something like that at at least two of the conferences I went to last six months, uh, Nokia Bell Labs. So they have been sort of enticing researchers with their version of that device. Apple's new AirPod 2 this year, rumor mill has it that it will have some health sensors. So I guess processors will make it there. But uh, I think right now there is nothing, oh, and Samsung came out with its power pod or whatever just a couple of days ago, right? I mean, I don't, anyone check it out, like what features it has or? Uh, but anyway, I just saw kind of a headline about it in some newspaper. Um, okay, so uh, blu uh, so Bluetooth five uh, in real life, um, data uh, real life things that you see are obviously considerably uh, more modest, uh, if you may. Um, uh, so you should always keep in mind that these wireless numbers are just peak idealized numbers. They are basically idealized in two different manners. Firstly, they're really the link symbol rate, okay? So they're not taking into account all those protocol layering and all. And the second thing is they're under some idealized channel, which again, you, sort of, you typically don't encounter. So you see a fair bit of uh, discrepancy between what happens. So uh, sort of uh, the connection speed versus network data rate versus the actual sustainable data rate that you end up seeing. But still, pretty good. I mean, you can uh, be in E5 and it's two megabit more for a shorter range. Have like one and a half megabit per second uh, before the protocol overhead, so before all that packet headers and all comes together. Okay, they also made, uh, after this experience and frankly commercial success of this tag, like devices, just the advertisement mode. Um, yeah, there are a whole bunch of extensions made to that uh, for next generation of uh, uh, Bluetooth uh, speakers. So uh, several different types of CDUs, idea being so that you can broadcast largest amounts of data and uh, you can also have like different sets of information being broadcast targeted in different audience and all. Um, there are also improvements in terms of duty cycling and also, uh, again, kind of, I have not gone through the standards and all and kind of easier material hasn't occurred, but uh, sort of these products have begun to come out in recent months, so uh, 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 sort of lot, so, so essentially these beacons have emerged as a important industry uh, segment uh, and uh, um, sort of, Bluetooth 5 has escaped into that. Uh, you can, uh, all this is kind of a mumbo jumbo from their website, much richer, multifaceted, uh, contextual, blah, blah, blah. 
So essentially like vending machines and these things, advertising stuff about themselves, about the battery levels, the content levels, stuff like that. So you can easily, without kind of, uh, essentially even in a disconnected setting in the sense, not accessing any internet server and all, objects nearby can tell you about themselves and can tell you a lot about themselves. So that's kind of notion of here. Um, so yeah, that summarizes some of those points. Um, uh, the Bluetooth 5 allows packets to be up to 255 bytes long as opposed to uh, the much shorter ones we had. So the payload instead of being 31 bytes can be a lot longer. Um, uh, and uh, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, another thing they have done is that the advertisement can carry a pointer to a packet being transmitted on some other channel. So essentially the idea is you can think of the advertisement as now table of content and then uh, it is pointing to a page number, but instead of putting it into the advertisement channel, because that's a busy channel, it's basically forwarding you to one of the other data channels where the device is transmitting this stuff also. So you can essentially have kind of richer information kind of going out. Uh, you can chain advertisement packets, so you can have whatever, bunch of these forming uh, more complicated, uh, larger information structure. Um, advertisement sets, uh, yeah. so the idea is that you can have a device transmitting different advertisements with different rates and all, okay, for different kind of devices uh, for this purpose. So this just makes things easier for other devices, like if I'm interested in topic A and I know it is only being transmitted once every 10 seconds, then I'll wake up accordingly. Let's see, I'm gonna skip these things, but basic point is that Bluetooth 5 has introduced a whole bunch of uh, sort of support for this beaconing industry in addition to those physical layer um, transmissions, okay. so. That was Bluetooth. Uh, it's a pretty cool technology and like the nice thing is that they're pretty robust uh, support for it uh, in uh, sort of writing code on basically almost every platform with, with this. Okay, so the next topic I want to start on is um, how to sense. Uh, so we have sort of seen processing and we have seen communication and then kind of the next part is uh, information that you're collecting, how do you go around processing it? Uh, I know many of you are doing courses in machine learning and stuff like that, so obviously that plays a role when processing sensor data. Um, you have probably done single processing courses and all, so again, those kind of material come in. Kind of the idea out here is in a single set, uh, place, I want to just describe to you what the pipeline looks like in a sort of in systems like these. Okay, so uh, that interface is what we're gonna focus on. Okay, so, uh, so sensing is what makes IoT kind of interesting. And if you kind of step back and think kind of a little bit more abstractly that what role sensor data kind of end up playing, so there are many different ways people kind of organize these things, but you can say that if, if you look at an overall intelligent system, then that's the first thing that happens, the perception of the environment, right? I mean, your sensors are basically giving you information. Um, they are in some physical modality, some waveform you capture uh, through a variety of these devices. I mean, sort of location and ultrasound and camera and radar and stuff like that. But they're just giving you information, observation about the environment. And that's the very first layer. And then that, so, so the term sensing is very nebulous, right? I mean, is that sensing or is it something, uh, some, something more? So then the next level up, which you could also consider part of sensing is that assigning some meaning to it, right? I mean, so it's not simply that I had accelerometer data or whatnot, but rather uh, I'm sensing, let's say, the activity state, like are you sitting or walking or running, right? So you can think of the concept of sensing really is kind of a multi-tiered one, okay? Uh, there is kind of these low-level primitives, and then the next level up, you derive more 
interesting, more complicated stuff from it. And sometimes even that is not enough. Sometimes you now want to go even further up and begin to say, look, this is really about saying something about the state of things and where things are headed. So um, sort of a moving targets, I'm going to sort of sense and predict based upon that. But be what it may, uh, all this stuff, which is in my eyes sort of part of this broader thinking stack, then based upon that, you feed it to something which decides what to do with it. And then finally, kind of an actuator which does some action. And that action could be some physical action, could be some informational action. So physical action could be whatever, close the door. Informational may be whatever, sound an alert or uh, put, flash something in front of the human. Um, it could be some subtle nudge. It could, all, all sort of systems you can imagine, okay. But almost any intelligent system has all these phases. But in many ways, I mean, this sensing part is kind of, in, kind of often the hardest piece really, really this, this, uh, this being able to say something about what's happening in the physical world and, and, and the objects in the physical world and all. Uh, sometimes people organize, kind of use other jargon like markers. So like in medicine, uh, the term marker is very important uh, thing. So they think of like these, uh, uh, like markers of cancer or markers of some other disease. And uh, they could be chemical in nature, they could be uh, some sort of a physiological sig uh, signal, some abnormality in, let's say, ECG signal and all. Uh, and then the uh, predictors, right? I mean, uh, so these are, these are other uh, garments which are, uh, which are used also. So take, for example, a mobile health kind of thing where you know, these devices are making quite a, um, uh, are, 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 are increasingly being used. So the notion, kind of the overall cycle, you can th uh, loop. You can think in terms of my sensors, like um, or a chest belt or PPG sensor and heart rate sensor in my watch and things like that. They result in markers for various things, like marker of uh, whatever, uh, lack of exercise or uh, some uh, whatever someone has fallen, stuff like that. From that marker, you seek to then derive make some some prediction about where things are headed, right? I mean, this person is not exercising sufficiently and therefore uh, there's a risk of uh, disease getting worse. And then you will have some sort of uh, intervention like a message popping up, you haven't, whatever, uh, you have been sitting too long and kind of stand up or something or maybe give an electrical shock to make you stand up, something like that. Um, Okay, so by the way, uh, last year there was a faculty candidate who was doing that. Okay, I was not kidding. So he had these devices and uh, he would intervene by essentially electrical stimulation on the skin and uh, so to cause you to do things, okay. So, and I've seen with cattle and all, they have done these kind of things to, uh, this was some project out of Australia where they'll shock the cattle if it strayed outside a geofence, okay. so. Uh, Sounds brutal, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, um, one type of uh, work in the space, sort of very loosely, has been about human activity detection. Uh, it's been a very popular area for people to work in, but the basic notion is that they're trying to detect things about you, okay? Uh, walk, sort of, they could be just typical physical actions that we engage in, uh, a whole variety of things, and a lot of other stuff. Like for example, um, just today uh, I was in an interview and this person was describing her work, um, and one issue which uh, I imagine some of you may be following that the so-called opioid crisis which has hit this country quite a bit, um, I didn't know but apparently one person every 11 or 12 minutes dies of that, okay? So what happens in opioid is that people inject themselves with these uh, drugs and uh, one of the side effect is that someone individual can stop breathing. And essentially, so, so they're trying to sense that, that subsequent to taking such an injection, there are um, breathing uh, cessation happening and trying to do it from 
phone in that particular case, but there are a variety of other ways. So that's an example. Another one is like usual medical things which happen in day-to-day -day life, but we don't have a way of testing in day-to-day -day life. So an example is sleep apnea, which basically during sleep, people sort of stop breathing. The problem is that if you suspect it, then they send you with these lots of sensors and all, and you put them in your nostril and kind of all over your body, and um, sort of usually you have to be in a so-called sleep lab, and things might be perfectly fine, and yet at home. So oftentimes, kind of the desire is being able to sense these things kind of 24-7 in a manner which is uh, not intrusive, right? Uh, so a lot of human activity-oriented work really has been driven by that, and through a combination of your sensors you wear, sensors in your phones, so devices which are kind of with you, uh, and things around you, so like um, steering wheels in the car and cameras in your home and stuff like that, they could come into play, and I guess the fourth category is sensors inside you someday, okay? Uh, not, not, yet very, not yet very common. Okay, so, all these things come in, but they go under this broad um, umbrella of what you can say is activity. And it could also include, like a lot of people work in uh, settings like detecting uh, whether um, an elderly care kind of setting, like has someone fallen, stuff like that, okay? So all, all, all those kind of things you can imagine uh, uh, coming in. I've, I mean, over the years, through various research grants and all, we have engaged in all all types of stuff, employers wanting to know um, things about the psychological states of their uh, workers to um, health conditions to sort of uh, all, 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 all sort of things fall into that category. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, there's a longer list out here uh, 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 which sort of goes into this. So how, how do we go around doing these kind of systems? Okay, so we have seen now kind of the from a platform perspective, but what the overall pipeline looks like is somewhere in your edge device, these IoT devices, you have these sensors, okay? And the variety of sensing modality, right? Could be the microphone in your phone to an uh, IMU, an inertial measurement unit, so it gives you expiration gyro. Uh, it could be a light sensor, it could be uh, some, uh, the PPG sensor to the back of, back of the wall. But deep down, these are some sort of analog signals and you amplify, filter, kind of like a radio. So this part is, radio is also a sensor, so very similar. So you ADC it, so you sample and digitize, so two things going on. Then finally you uh, hit the digital phase where uh, you try to make some inference and the outcome of, outcome of that is either some class label, like the person is walking, or some sort of a number which is uh, saying something about like what the speed is and all. So one is called classification and the other is called, anyone? Regression, right? So classification, regression. Regression is when you are outputting a number, okay? You can think of it as classes embedded in some sort of a metric space, right? I mean, so that you can talk about distance and everything else. Okay, so that's the basic pipeline. Uh, let's look at uh, some of a couple of points of interest out here. Well, some of it is kind of just probably seen in other courses, how to design amplifiers and analog filters and stuff like that. I want to talk a little bit about sampling because a lot of innovations have happened there and inference, um, yeah, which is yeah, essentially signal processing and machine learning. Okay, so sampling the waveforms. Uh, need for sampling is, uh, uh, yeah, basically because the underlying thing is continuous and for us to be able to process it, we need to discretize it both in time and in values, right? So one is the digitization and the other is sampling. Uh, uh, so um, sort of uh, the other reason you want to sample is that even if the underlying waveform was already digital, you may not want to process all those samples because it might be unnecessarily too frequent. So like for example, I if you think of GPS, um, by the time you see the GPS location trace, it's already digitized, it's already sampled. But maybe it is too frequent for you. Maybe you can sample less, in which case you can duty cycle the GPS. Uh, so 
So all of those things sort of fit into this category. Uh, so you can say basically sa uh, sampling is a process of selecting a subset out of uh, sort of a more frequent uh, time series or a continuous signal. And in E terms, um, uh, in, e, in E, uh, yeah, sort of we refer to uh, such a sample signal as discrete time. So classically, uh, we sample based upon the Nyquist rate, basically. So um, kind of thing is appalling that uh, anytime you sample, uh, uh, there is information loss pot potentially because of two reasons, right? One is because we are measuring the signal now only at select spots, and the other is because we are going digital, so the continuous values valued are no longer continuous values, so that's the quantization loss, right? Depending upon how many bits you use. Um, so, but by the act of sampling is basically saying, look, information in the middle is being lost. And indeed, if the signals were totally arbitrary, that would be the case, right? I mean, if I'm if the waveform can be arbitrary and I'm sampling, then tough luck. I really can't do anything about it. Um, I'm sampling and I get some subset of, out of that. So what, uh, what happens now is that if you have a model of some form of the signal, some constraint on the signal, then perhaps you can get away with sampling and not lose anything. And what Nyquist sampling theorem said is that if my signals are such that their bandwidth is certain amount, and if I'm sampling them at twice that peak, uh, peak bandwidth, then I can reconstruct the signal perfectly using a particular interpolation, okay? Uh, where my basis function is a sync function, and I multiply them by the sample values and kind of add them up, right? So all of you would know that. So, uh, so for a band-limited signal, Nyquist sampling can help us reconstruct. Now it raises uh, kind of two possible directions of uh, thoughts. Uh, one is, uh, uh, well, so firstly, if the signal is not band-limited, then I cannot uh, recover it. But two, two things pop up out here. One is, is recovery the goal always? Like for example, is it important for you to reconstruct the signal or are there cases where maybe you don't need to reconstruct, maybe you need just some statistic or some other aspect of the signal, right? I mean, so, uh, because usually if I take a signal, then we do stuff to it and eventually to get a, make it go through machine learning model and all, and eventually we get a class label or a value. And that's really what we care about, right? So you can conceptually think of I had x, I'm doing f of x, and it's f of x which is interesting, right? So maybe I can sample uh, and recover f of x, but not x. And that's fine for my purposes, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, in what if I knew more about the signal? So here I made the assumption that I knew the signal was band limited. But let's say if you knew something else about the signal. Like for example, if you knew that the signal linearly rises at time, how would you sample it? Like the frequency? No, the signal amplitude, yeah. signal is just, this value just rises at time forever. You just need two points. You just need two points, right? So the more you know about the signal, the smarter you can be about sampling, mm -hmm. right? Look at, a lot of signals that we encounter in real life, right? I mean, um, ECG signal, it's not totally arbitrary, right? It's, a, okay, it's not periodic in a strict sense, but there is a lot of structure to it, right? So uh, could we make use of, could we make use of uh, that to property to kind of be smarter about sampling? So uh, now that was a ridiculous example of straight line, but you kind of hopefully get the gist. And um, now if you, if you sample at a rate insufficient to the assumptions you had, so in case of Nyquist, if you sample at a rate which is less than of sufficient frequency, then if you look at the spectrum, what happens is uh, that, uh, so if you sample a signal, then essentially it is replicating in spectrum, and if you're not sampling with sufficient frequency, then essentially the spectrum overlap and you have 
information is, is irretrievably lost. So that's a classic Nyquist sampling thing. So it's very important to sample at the right frequency. Let's say your signal, your sampling rate is it's two questions. Firstly, uh, if your sampling rate was, uh, is, is you're given an A to D converter, it, it, it has some peak sampling rate. How will you ensure uh, that you are meeting this requirement? That your sampling rate does that. Okay, if you knew it, but almost never so signals are like that. Huh? Yeah, but you almost never know that. So you put a filter, right? So you make sure that there are no components. Otherwise, you are basically going to introduce aliasing related problems, right? So very important. Now, usually we see on a microcontroller and all, we just feed the analog signal. Why do we get away with it? I just told you, we need to filter to make sure that the frequency meets the uh, requirement. Huh? So are these microcontrollers filtering the signal? Yeah, well, they must be. So where is that coming from, right? It's usually not inside the microcontroller, but your board traces have some capacitance. And okay, so you kind of are relying on it. But you usually shouldn't get away with it. A good design would have a uh, so-called anti-aliasing filter, OK? My next question, and then we'll stop for the day. Uh, what if I messed up? I sampled it. Can I recover it somehow with a smart algorithm? You could if you um, you can do something with the structure of the cable if you have plates. I don't know. You can't do it in general though. Can't do it in general. Okay, so it's too late. Okay, so uh, so it's once things are messed up, this is a new spectrum. And whatever temporal signal corresponds to it, right? I mean, that's, so you can't save yourself digitally later on, no. however you might want to. Okay. So, um, so let's. Uh, so very important to have this anti-aliasing, uh, anti-aliasing filter. Okay. Uh, so we'll see you on Tuesday.